introducing, uh, reintroducing Dr. Sumit Natal, who will kick off our next panel. Hey, thank you, guys. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Mimi Canto. She is a therapeutic endoscopist. She directs the Heartburn Center, the clinical research, and is also the principal investigator for the National TIF Registry. And she's a professor of medicine and oncology at John Hopkins. Over to you, Dr. Canto. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sumit, for that introduction. It's with great pleasure that I can introduce the first scientific session of the AFS. Uh, Lee and I, who is my co-moderator and the abstract committee, scored numerous abstracts that were submitted, and we were really impressed with the quality of the science. And in fact, you'll hear soon many of these issues that have been asked in the question and answer session and in this particular session reflected in the science. We will present the first four abstracts. I'll introduce them now. We'll have a discussion. And then the final three abstracts will be introduced by uh, Lee. Uh, you'll see that in the discussion session, there will be also questions that can be answered. And also in the second set of discussions, questions can also be answered. So to kick off this scientific session, I'd like to um, tell you about the first four abstracts. The first one to be presented by Brett Parker from Portland, that's Lee Swanstrom's group. The second one by Colin Dunn from USC, that's John Lipham's group. Daniela Assis from Baltimore, or Johns Hopkins group will present the third one. And Dolores Mueller from Oregon with Christy Dunst will present the fourth one. Hi everyone, my name is Brett Parker and I am a former advanced GI foregut fellow at the Oregon Clinic in Portland, Oregon. Thank you for this unique opportunity to virtually share our findings with you. I have no disclosures. Today I'll be presenting the impact of body mass index on recurrence rates following laparoscopic parasophageal hernia repair. As with many research projects, this study spawned from a common dilemma encountered in clinical practice. The severely obese patient who presents to your office with a symptomatic paraesophageal hernia. Data suggests that patients with clinically severe obesity have higher recurrence rates after hiatal closure and fund application, though most of these studies focused on the repair of type 1 sliding hiatal hernias during anti-reflux surgery. Although there is evidence that sliding hiatal hernias progress to paraesophageal hernias over time, these pathologies are managed as entirely separate entities as they generally occur in different patient populations, each with unique perioperative risks and indications for repair. Yet many surgeons extrapolate the results from the sliding hiatal hernia literature to the smaller subset of patients with paraesophageal hernias as well, and may hesitate to offer paraesophageal hernia repair to patients with obesity without a concurrent weight loss surgery. The aim of this study is to assess the impact of body mass index on hernia recurrence rates following laparoscopic paraesophageal hernia repair. Our retrospective review of a prospectively collected foregut surgical database was performed to identify patients who underwent elective laparoscopic paraesophageal hernia repair between 2006 and 2012. Concurrent bariatric surgery was routinely offered to those patients who met criteria. We then applied our research study criteria as shown here. Inclusion criteria consisted of all elective laparoscopic parasophageal hernia repairs using non-permanent mesh and any configuration of fund application. Exclusion criteria consisted of sliding type 1 hiatal hernias, a history of foregut surgery or redo operations, and any patient who required an adjunct procedure such as a collis gastroplasty or a diaphragm relaxing incision. To be clear, Patients who qualified and wished to proceed with concurrent weight loss surgery were not included in this study. All patients had follow-up greater than one year post-op, consisting of either an upper endoscopy and or an upper GI contrast study. We first grouped our patients into cohorts of less than and greater than BMI 35. We use these cutoffs as they are routinely used to offer bariatric surgery. We also stratified our patients by BMI class as defined by the CDC and compared outcomes. You can see here in this slide the results of our cohort size and distribution. 
236 patients met criteria and were included in our analysis. This reflected a 67.4% follow-up rate with a mean follow-up of 34 months. It's worth mentioning that 20% of our study population met criteria for bariatric surgery, but did not wish to pursue this option for various reasons. This next slide is a pie chart that compares the distribution of our study patients in each BMI class to the general population in the US during that time period. In general, our study population was representative with a slightly higher proportion of patients in the higher BMI classes than the rest of the US and with normal weight individuals being slightly underrepresented. The next few slides reveal the most clinically significant results of our study. When comparing outcomes in individuals who would qualify for weight loss surgery versus those who would not, in other words, BMI less than and greater than 35, we found no significant difference between recurrence rates or complication rates. You can see on the bar graph to the left of the screen that the rates of recurrence between patients with BMI of less than 35 and greater than 35 were nearly identical at 24% and 23% respectively. The demographics and mean follow-up for these two cohorts were also largely similar. The overall hernia recurrence rate for our entire cohort was 23.7%, as can be seen on the left of the screen. That's 56 out of 236 patients. After further categorizing our patients by BMI class, we again found no significant difference in recurrence rates between each class. Interestingly, hernia recurrence was significantly less frequent for normal weight individuals when compared to the rest of the BMI classifications combined. You can also see here that the degree of obesity has no impact on worsening outcomes as you look to the right of the bar graph. As a side note, we also compare patients with recurrent hernias versus those without recurrent hernias, and the mean BMI was similar at 30.9 and 30.3, respectively. Lastly, there was no significant difference between the operative complications between BMI classifications. As you see to the right of the screen, there appears to be a data trend showing a higher rate of complications in the BMI over 40 group though this was not statistically significant and likely underpowered as there were only 11 patients in this category with three complications. In conclusion, while it may not be surprising that hernia recurrence rates after laparoscopic paraesophageal hernia repair are significantly less for normal weight individuals, we did discover that the degree of obesity does not appear to negatively impact hernia recurrence or complication rates. As such, for obese patients who do not qualify for or do not wish to proceed with weight loss surgery, BMI alone should not be an exclusion criteria for parasophageal hernia repair, though a preoperative weight loss program should be considered when clinically reasonable. Thank you very much. Hello, and thanks for listening. Uh, this is Colin Dunn. I'm the research fellow for the Division of Upper GI and General Surgery at USC. And I'd like to present uh, some of our outcomes using magnetic sphincter augmentation along with hiatal hernia repair. Um, as a disclosure, Dr. Lipham and Dr. Bill Zukevich are consultants for Ethicon, which makes the Lynx device. So uh, if you all recall, the Lynx device is a chain of connected uh, magnetic beads, which uh, relaxes and allows for passage of a food bolus and then recontracts to prevent esophageal reflux. Um, so is this device uh, feasible in the context of a hiatal hernia repair? Can you place it and also repair a hiatal hernia? Well, short-term results have said, yes, that this is safe and feasible and doable. But is the repair durable along with um, this hiatal hernia repair, or do you need to still do a fund application instead? Well, our group set out to investigate this. So we reviewed uh, our retrospective uh, lead collected data um, from 2009 to 2016 on about 79 patients. Um, all patients had pre-op pH monitoring for 48 hours. They also had a VET and EGD. Uh, they were contacted for annual follow-up with EGD and pH monitoring to assess for their uh, hiatal hernia recurrence. So basically we tortured them annually until they uh, were lost to follow-up. Uh, we also had clinical follow-up at two weeks, six months, one year, and then annually where we gave them a quality of life questionnaire 
that's the GERD HRQL. So we had a median intraop high yield hernia size of 4.5 centimeters and a mean duration of procedure of a little bit over an hour. So pretty quick, just like how I'm talking. The recurrence rate was about 2.98 years. Uh, there were five recurrences, 6.4%. Uh, uh, each of these recurrences was about three to four centimeters in size. Um, the median time to recurrence was a little bit over three years, 3.07. 60% uh, of the patients who had a recurrence actually had an initial hiatal hernia size greater than five centimeters. And one of the patients developed symptoms and required reoperation. The rest did not. They just had radiographic recurrence. So overall, how did the patients feel? Uh, at latest follow-up, the median quality of life score was two, very nice, uh, a decrease by 19 points from their pre-op values. 90% uh, of the patients noted improvement or complete resolution of their symptoms, and 84% of the patients were completely off their anti-secretory medication. Um, there was also a significant decrease in the Demeester score from 42.5 to 9.1. Uh, 20% of the patients with Barrett's pre-op also had resolution of their Barrett's completely in this cohort. Um, we tried to find out whether there was any associations with recurrence. Um, so who was more likely to develop a hiatal hernia recurrence? But we didn't find any association between age, gender, BMI, or initial size of the hiatal hernia defect. Um, so initial papers from our group showed a 2% recurrence rate of hiatal hernia, and now we're up to 6.4% with longer term follow-up, but that's still very, very low. That's lower than the fundal uh, literature rates of 30 to 50% with a median time to reoperation of about 3.88 years. Um, so why do we think there's this difference in outcomes? Well, uh, one, it may be that the MSA device is smaller than a bulk wrap, and this puts less pressure on the uh, diaphragmatic crural repair. Or maybe there's less gastric distension because these patients with MSA have preserved the ability to belch and vomit. And if the gastric distension is putting pressure on the chiroplasty, perhaps that's another reason why these patients are less likely to fail with MSA than with a traditional fundoplication. So future research should look at a continued follow-up of this cohort. And also we should do a larger multi-center study in order to tease out better those risk factors for recurrence. Thanks very much for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Daniela Assis and first I would like to thank the panel for inviting us to present today. I'm really honored to be here presenting on behalf of our group. So today we'll talk about the prevalence and clinical significance of esophageal gastric outflow obstruction, also known as EGG outflow obstruction, in patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease, also called GERD. So what causes GERD? The most fundamental abnormality in GERD is thought to be from an incompetent esophageal gastric junction. Um, what is EGG outflow obstruction? So it's a relatively new diagnostic entity. It is diagnosed by high-resolution esophageal monometry, and Chicago Classification Version 3 defines it as a pathologic obstruction at the level of the EGG in the setting of preserved peristalsis. This obstruction is measured by the integrated relaxation pressure, also known as the IRP, or the mean pressure registered during the post-eglutative period. So can GERD and EGG outflow obstruction coexist? The idea of both together seems counterintuitive. EGG outflow obstruction is known for LES hypertension, while GERD is associated with LES hypotension. So could EGG outflow obstruction be misdiagnosed by HREM in GERD patients? Current Chicago classification requires swallows in the supine position, but if we think about it, physiologic swallowing happens in the upright position. So our aims were to assess the prevalence of EGG outflow obstruction in patients evaluated for GERD and to determine if upright swallows during HREM correct the IRP, suggesting, to, suggesting artifact as opposed to a true EGG outflow obstruction. We hypothesized that upright swallows might correct the IRP in the majority of GERD patients diagnosed with EGG outflow obstruction. So this is a prospective cohort study of 364 patients with GERD symptoms evaluated at the Johns Hopkins Harper Center. Um, patients completed a baseline medical survey and standardized GERD quality of life questionnaires, such as the GERD health-related quality of life survey and the reflux symptom index. HREM studies were reviewed by motility faculty and results were correlated with Barian cine esophagram, EGD, and pH testing. Looking at our results, 364 patients were evaluated for GERD symptoms. 
147 patients underwent an esophageal manometry and 83 of them were normal. Among the abnormal, this uh, manometry, 64 manometries were abnormal and 26 patients had a diagnosis of Chicago classification EGG outflow obstruction. Looking at our baseline characteristics, most of the patients were female patients with a mean age of 53.45 years of age and a mean BMI of 28.41. Half of the patients had a hiatal hernia and a little under 50% reported dysphagia. So let's look closer into the upright swallows now. So among the 26 patients diagnosed with EGD outflow obstruction, 17 performed upright swallows and 13 corrected IRP were, and were termed as false EGJ um, outflow obstruction or HREM artifact. So here's an example of how upright swallows can dramatically affect the IRP. On the left, we can clearly see a band of pressure demonstrated by this greenish color, where on the right, we notice that the same area lacks that pressure presented by the predominance of a blue area indicating a lower pressure. On the left image, the patient performed the swallow in the supine position. And on the right image, the patient was sitting upright. So four patients did not correct the IRP. Among these four patients, three had a secondary cause for their EGG outflow obstruction, such as a mechanical cause like a hiatal hernia or medication-induced cause. And they were classified as secondary EGG outflow obstruction. Only one patient did not present any mechanical or medication-induced cause for a higher LES pressure and was termed as idiopathic EGG outflow obstruction. So is there a way to predict true or false EGG outflow obstruction with GERD phenotype? In the group who corrected IRP with upright swallows, meaning the false EGG outflow obstruction group, more heartburn symptoms were observed. In the patients with true EGG outflow obstruction, regurgitation was more prevalent. So due to the small sample size, we cannot make a broad conclusion here, but we can see from this data that there is a trend between heartburn and regurgitation. We also observed that in both groups, um, dysphagia was reported in more than half of the patients. So what are the strengths and weaknesses of our study? I would say that the weaknesses are that we have a small sample size and one third of the patients were lost due to not having upright swallows. Um, the strengths are that it is, a, it is a prospective study. We had motility experts available to help, and to our knowledge, it's the only, it's one of the first studies that evaluated the prevalence of EGG outflow obstruction in the setting of GERD. So in conclusion, we found that upright swallows during HREM corrected the, uh, the IRP in most patients with GERD who were initially diagnosed as EGG outflow obstruction by Chicago classification. And routine upright swallows during HREM may minimize the misdiagnosis of EGG outflow obstruction in the setting of a confirmed GERD. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dolores Mueller, and I'm a research fellow with the Oregon Clinic in Portland. I would like to thank AFS for the opportunity to present my work on high resolution manometry and a functioning fund application establishing a standard. I received a research stipend from Restec outside of the submitted work, all other authors have nothing to disclose. Laparoscopic fund application has proven to be a safe and effective treatment for gastroesophageal reflux disease. However, postoperative dysphagia is always a concern. In the absence of anatomic abnormalities, HRM is often used to evaluate those patients. The Chicago classification was devised to correlate HRM values with dysphagia in patients with swallowing disorders. However, it is unclear whether those values are applicable after a fundification, as normal values for HRM after a fundification are not well described in the literature. Aim of our study was to provide a full HRM data set in patients with a normal functioning fundification. Our patients are routinely asked to return at one year for an objective follow-up, including pH testing and manometry. We reviewed patients for, with primary laparoscopic fundification for reflux disease between 2013 and 2019 that returned for the one-year follow-up. We performed a consecutive review until 50 patients met inclusion criteria. 
Only patients with a pre- and post-operative pH monitoring and HRM were included into our study. All post-operative HRMs were performed using a Sandhill scientific or non diversity healthcare system. We further identified patients with a normal functioning fund application as a successful outcome. We defined this as resolution of pre-op symptoms and no significant post-op side effects. No dysphagia, meaning on a scale from one from zero to four, zero dysphagia, and a normal acid exposure score as obtained by esophageal pH testing. This table summarizes our post-operative HRM data as obtained by the study. A total of 50 patients met inclusion criteria, 33 Nissans, and 17 to pay patients. As you can see, no statistically significant difference was seen between body motility characteristics or LES characteristics and manometry between both patient groups. However, the IRP was still different between patients that underwent Nissen fundification and patients that underwent to pay fundifications, with Nissen patients having a median IRP of 15 millimeters mercury and to pay patients having a median IRP of 12. Because no statistically significant difference was observed between both patient groups, for a final cohort, we combined the data to show 50 patients with a normal functioning fund application. As expected, the fund application augmentation significantly increased LES values in manometry. The IRP was increased to 14 with a 95th percentile of 25.6. This table further summarizes our findings regarding the IRP in our cohort. The median of the total cohort was 14, and as mentioned before, 15 for complete fundification and 12 for partial, with the 95th percentile being 25.6 for the total cohort, 29 for complete fundification, and 23 for partial. This graph further shows the distribution of the IRP in our total cohort. 20 millimeters mercury is the currently published threshold for the diversity healthcare system that we used for the manometry measurements. As you can see, a great number of patients exceeded this current, currently published threshold. We would further like to emphasize that thresholds published are technology specific. Um, our study used the Santal Diversitec system, which had a previous published threshold of 14 or the 95th percentile of 25, 20.5. The Unisensor system had a previously published threshold of 28.3 and most commonly used the Chicago classification using the Sierra system with a threshold of 15. We hope our data provides a good reference standard for post-fund application patients. As you can see, the fund application significantly increases the LES pressure as measured with HRM, including the total length of the LES, the resting pressure, and the IRP. The previously accepted upper limit for EGJ outflow obstruction is not applicable after front application, as most of our patients exceeded this value. Interestingly, no difference between Nissen and Tupé front application was seen. We would like to emphasize that differences in values between different HRM systems exist and are not well described in the literature so far. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for those great presentations. By the way, just to remind you that the top two presentations will be awarded in the next or last session, so please stick around. So to continue with this great scientific session, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Lee Swanstrom. He's an internationally renowned for good surgeon who has a remarkable career in endoscopic and surgical innovation. He is a past president of SAGES and indeed was rece received the SAGES Award for his recognition of his accomplishments. Currently, he's the scientific director and the chief innovations officer of the Institute for Image Guided Surgery, University of Strasbourg in France. Welcome, Lee, and take it from here. Thank you, Mimi. Um, that was a great uh, group of presentations. Uh, 
have to say that a little conflict of interest because a couple of uh, presenters are people that I've worked with in the past. So uh, congratulations to all though. Um, fantastic presentations, very challenging subjects. And um, I think we have a few questions uh, to ask you before we go on to our next group of uh, presenters. So um, we have a question here in the, from uh, Sally Samo in the high resolution manometry post fund application study, mechanical abnormality found with fund application despite patients being asymptomatic. How, how can that happen? Uh, that you can have a mechanical uh, abnormality and yet uh, have an asymptomatic patient? Um, of course, patients symptoms are very subjective. So we oftentimes see patients pre-op or even post-op that don't show any symptoms and symptoms are so subjective and have such a variety um, that, yeah. I mean, we even see pre-op patients that have high R IRBs and don't have dysphagia. So I guess um, symptoms don't correlate very well with um, high resolution manometry measurements. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, good answer. Uh, Brett, I had a question. Um, you know, it's, it's always an ongoing controversy about uh, what to do with obese patients or morbidly obese patients. Uh, your data seems to say that it doesn't matter. Uh, you can do a fund application if they want a fund application. What will you do in your future practice uh, in your post-fellowship um, experience? Yeah, I think it's a good question. So any patient that... Um you know, walks into my office, the first thing I'm, I think I'm going to note is whether or not they have uh, clinically significant obesity and use that uh, sort of as a binary tool, um, knowing that the results of our study showed that, you know, normal weight individuals have lower uh, recurrence rate and better outcomes. Um, in my personal practice, when they meet criteria for bariatric surgery, uh, meaning over a BMI of 35 with appropriate comorbidities, I would offer a concurrent weight loss surgery at the same time as uh, parasophageal hernia repair. I think that there's uh, you know, great evidence out there to show that that can be done safely and effectively. Um, if they're not interested in having that conversation, then I would move forward with a, a, a standard parasophageal hernia repair and you know, um, maybe discuss uh, weight loss surgery at a later date. Okay, so I have a challenge for you from one of our panelists. Uh, uh, Sumit uh, asks, if you had a patient come into your clinic with a BMI greater than 40, so truly a morbidly obese patient, uh, what would you do? I mean, what's your definitive cutoff on there? If they're BMI 50, 45, 60, uh, when would you not offer them uh, primary anti-reflux surgery? Uh, so that's a very, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, those patients are out there. I think they are underrepresented in the literature. I think that a lot of times uh, these referrals aren't sent to the surgeons because they think they're poor surgical candidates. And so we don't really know um, exactly what the, uh, you know, class three and, and higher obese patients, uh, you know, how they do after standard parasophageal hernia repair. So um, you know, obviously the first thing I would discuss is a concurrent weight loss surgery and assuming that they're surgically fit and they have concerning symptoms, um, I think that I would still move forward with, um, a standard repair and not note the degree of obesity as being a significant, uh, contributing factor to recurrence rates. I mean, I think that I would obviously look at the patient and make sure that they, uh, were optimized for surgery and, you know, discuss with them uh, a weight loss plan if possible. But I think it really comes down to preventing a outcome in a symptomatic patient um, uh, that potentially could be avoided. So I would uh, try not to use the degree of obesity as um, a measuring stick in deciding whether or not to offer them surgery, because we don't know. Yep. Uh, good response. Uh, Colin, I might ask you a question about um, some pretty compelling data about uh, 
um, links procedure and magnetic sphincter augmentation. Uh, do you think it potentially could replace thundoplication um, in a general practice? That's a great question. I think for a lot of patients, um, it could be an excellent choice and modality to be used. Um, there have been lots of studies published out of USC that have shown that in a lot of the groups which were initial, initially contraindicated to receive a links, that now it's safe to do so, or just as effective, if not more so, such as uh, short length Barrett's and um, uh, even some BMI, uh, heavy BMI patients. But uh, some of the hasn't really um, been fully figured out yet in terms of uh, ineffective esophageal motility or, or patients with long segment Barrett's, uh, whether it would be safe to use uh, for them. So I would say that for the majority of patients, it's uh, a safe thing to do and to recommend. You can certainly have a conversation uh, with your patient uh, as that being a, a great option for them because it's less invasive. Um, but you still need to have uh, that discussion and individualize your treatment to each patient because of those contraindications. Do you think uh, it's a procedure that's maybe more applicable to less experienced surgeons? Uh, that it's um, uh, thundoplications, as we know, are difficult to teach, they're difficult to learn because they're somewhat subjective and artisanal, if you will. Uh, do you think uh, um, MSA is uh, kind of a, a more generalizable procedure? Yes, I think that in addition to preserving the ability to belch and vomit and not having the same uh, gastric bloat symptoms, uh, MSA is a great um, tool to be used for that very reason. Uh, it's easier to put in, and uh, as um, Dr. Bell discussed, it's also easy to take out in the rare chance that you have a complication associated with it. and You don't have the same likelihood of damaging the stomach uh, if you had to remove it. So um, for the average uh, sort of community-based uh, anti-reflux surgeon, uh, I think it's a great uh, tool to have. Okay, kind of avoided my question, whether the, kind of an inexperienced surgeon can do a good fundoplication by using MSA uh, versus a long learning curve for a, a Nissen or a toupee. All right, let me, let me be more specific. But yeah, I think, it, I, I think it's much easier to, to put in than to do a, a fund application. And I agree with you that it is more um, artisanal, as you said, to, to put in a, to do a correct fund application and, and exactly how, how to measure that. Um, so links would be easier to, to put in. So uh, another question from one of our panelists was, how, what's the best way to measure a hiatal hernia? Talk about big hiatal hernias, small hiatal hernias, the difference in outcomes based on that. Uh, best way, barium swallows, uh, endoscopy, uh, intraoperative measurements. Uh, maybe each of you can give a brief comment what you think the best way of measuring it is. Yeah, I personally uh, believe upper GI barium swallow and or endoscopy. Um, would be my tool of choice. I think that it's uh, a dynamic uh, pathology and watching it in real time, whether it's under a, a very well done uh, upper GI study or monitoring it with direct visualization during endoscopy, you can get, get a size of you know, the hernia, a sense of the change and its response to intrathoracic pressure you know, upon insufflation. It's very uh, important. So um, I would choose both modalities uh, is my uh, tool of choice. Uh, Dolores, do you want to? I absolutely agree with Brett, but I also learned with Brett, so I'm kind of biased there. <laughs> All right. Uh, our other uh, discussants, Colin? Oh. For our study, we used a specific uh, laparoscopic sizing tool to determine the axial dimensions of the hiatal hernia, and we used that as our um, sort of gold standard measurement. Um, I have read uh, some literature supporting the fact that you can measure accurately with both um, barium swallow and uh, with uh, 
doing an endoscopy. Um, in terms of, I think, USC's institution, and more, more people argue for using barium, in my experience. And how about Hopkins? What's the approach at um, Johns Hopkins? Might be muted. No, still can't hear you. No? Is there any way to unmute her? Danielle, we can't hear you, so uh, I don't think we'll get to hear what the Hopkins approach is, unfortunately. Um, anyway, those great responses to the questions. I don't see that we have any other questions that have been brought forward. Uh, so I want to thank you all. Great presentations, um, very interesting subjects, and uh, uh, may the best person win. Thank you, Dr. Swasson. Thank you. Lee, did you want Hello. to introduce the My name is uh, George Bison, and I'm here to present our work on outcomes of magnetic sphincter augmentation in patients with ineffective esophageal motility. As we know, magnetic sphincter augmentation devices, aka LINCS, was approved by the FDA in 2012 for gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, treatment. However, each uh, of the early LINCS trials excluded patients with abnormal motility, and it remains unknown how patients with abnormal motility respond to magnetic sphincter augmentation. One such subset of patients are those with ineffective uh, esophageal motility. We hypothesize that IEM patients who underwent MSA had similar outcomes when compared to normal motility patients who also underwent MSA. Therefore, we focused on outlining clinical outcomes of MSA patients uh, with ineffective esophageal motility, particularly focusing on dysphagia and quality of life, as well as looking at rate of intervention and explantation and trying to delineate thresholds for which links placement would be inappropriate. Therefore, we conducted a multi-institutional international retrospective study looking at adult patients who underwent magnetic sphincter augmentation between 2012 and 2017. We included patients with IEM defined as greater than 50% ineffective swallows and matched these patients to a cohort of patients with normal motility who also underwent MSA um, implantation. Patients were matched based on gender, BMI, presence of virus esophagus, and hydrohernia size. We excluded all patients with prior foregut surgery, hydrohernia is greater than five centimeters, and pediatric patients. The IEM group had a mean age of 49, mean BMI of 26, and was predominantly male. This group had a preoperative dysphagia rate of 19% based on the GED HRQRO questionnaire. These clinical characteristics were similar to the non-IEM group except for duration of symptoms and extent of crow dissection. Postoperatively, there are very few complications from MSA both in IEM and non-IEM patients. And at one year, there is significant improvement in quality of life scores comparable in both IEM and non-IEM patients. When we assessed for dysphagia using the GET HRKO dysphagia specific assessment tool, we observed that of the IEM patients without preoperative dysphagia, the majority continued to have no dysphagia postoperatively, while a small percentage developed new onset dysphagia. Of the patients with preoperative dysphagia, most had resolution, while a few had persistent dysphagia postoperatively. A similar trend was noted in normal motility patients, with the majority having persistent non-dysphagia, as well as demonstrating a high rate of dysphagia resolution. Both IEM and non-IEM had similar explantation rates over this time period. However, IEM patients were predominantly explanted for dysphagia, while non-IEM patients were explanted for GERD symptoms. Furthermore, IEM patients selectively underwent partial fundoplicate 
glycation after explantation compared to non-IEM patients studied in Neeson after explantation. Regression analysis to evaluate the risk of needing postoperative intervention, either dilation or explantation, revealed that IEM was not an independent predictor, although having less than 40% intact values was associated with a twofold risk. Other risk factors identified included older age, having preoperative dysphagia, and having been sized for smaller device. Therefore, we concluded that one, Magnetic signal augmentation in IEM patients demonstrates co comparable rates of improvement in quality of life scores to those patients with normal motility. Two, there are high rates of improvement in dysphagia in both groups, high rates of persistent non-dysphagia in both groups as well. And although we noted a slightly higher rate of persistent dysphagia in, in the IEM patients, this was not statistically significant. IEM patients also had a similar need for postoperative explantation to normal motility patients. And finally, IEM should not preclude MSA uh, in well-selected patients with GAD. We believe MSA may be an option in a select subset of IEM patients, such as those with no preoperative dysphagia. Thank you. Thank you to the AFS for the opportunity to present our research entitled today. I'll be presenting on behalf of all co-authors a study titled The Prognostic Impact of the Presence of Barrett's Esophagus on Esophageal Adenocarcinoma Survival. Esophageal cancer is a highly lethal cancer. Its incidence has been increasing over the last few decades and it is now 3.76 per 100,000 person years. Barrett's esophagus, defined by the presence of intestinal metaplasia on histology, is really thought to be the only identifiable precursor lesion for esophageal adenocarcinoma. Barrett's affects up to 5% of the general population and results from chronic acid exposure of the distal esophagus, which leads to IM and progresses in a very well-described stepwise fashion from non-dysplastic to low-grade, high-grade intramucosal carcinoma and finally to invasive adenocarcinoma. Recent studies have suggested the possibility of an alternate non-Barrett's, non-IM pathway of EAC that is associated with more aggressive disease and worse survival. Now, if this were to be confirmed, this would really have significant implications for our approach to identifying people who are at risk for Barrett's, screening, surveillance, and also just our overall understanding of the epidemiology of this disease. So with this in mind, the aims of our study were to look at a cohort of esophageal cancer patients and to analyze survival according to the presence of Barrett's esophagus and intestinal metaplasia, as well as to determine predictors of survival. This was a retrospective cohort study of patients who had histologically confirmed esophageal adenocarcinoma at a single uh, center, University of Colorado Hospital, over a 10-year time period. And only C were one in two cases were included. Now, every audience, uh, we're, you know, apologize to our, our presenters. Uh, we're missing some of the slides, so we're going to try that again. Uh, maybe we'll start with Walter Chen uh, because he has his slides up, and then we'll, we'll repeat the talks that we just went through and maybe shorten the discussion phase a little bit because I think it's important that you get to see their data. Thank you for the opportunity to present our research today. I'm going to be talking about the use of advanced impedance metrics on impedance pH testing to predict lung function decline among IPF patients. Traditional impedance pH testing has been widely used in assessing esophageal symptoms of reflux, particularly in patients refractory to PPI therapy. There have also been recent studies showing correlation between impedance pH testing and extraesophageal extra manifestations of reflux, including pulmonary disease. However, the exact role of these tests in working up and managing extra esophageal reflux has not been firmly established. In impedance pH testing, reflux episodes are identified as a greater than 50% drop in impedance from the baseline, propagating in a retrograde fashion, as shown in this figure. The measurement of impedance reflux events have been shown to have high interrater variability, and there are also patient factors that, that may affect the consistency of results. So given these limitations, how else can we objectively assess the burden of reflux and its correlation with uh, reflux outcomes? 
a couple of uh, metrics, uh, we call them advanced metrics of the device to help us uh, further evaluate reflux in patients. The mean nocturnal baseline impedance or MMBI is a novel measure of esophageal mucosal integrity and it has been correlated with increased reflux burden and patient reported esophageal symptoms. There's several advantages to MMBI. They're easily obtained. The results may not be subjected uh, to changes uh, by being on PPI during the test. And it may potentially reduce inter-rater variability. However, MMBI has not yet been well established in evaluating extraesophageal reflux. The other metric is the post-swallow peristaltic wave index, which is a measure of distal esophageal acid clearance. This index measures a percentage of impedance reflux events that are followed by peristaltic swallow within 30 seconds of the end of the reflux event, as shown here in this figure. PSPW index is therefore a marker for chemical clearance of the distal esophagus, and it has been shown to be impaired in patient reflux, as these patients cannot clear refluxate as well. And this index has, not been, shown, has been shown to be not altered by medical or surgical therapy. In prior studies, low PSPW index have been shown to be associated with erosive reflux disease, Barrett's esophagus, and dysplasia progression in Barrett's esophagus. However, there's really no evidence thus far for using a PSPW index in evaluating extraesophageal GERD manifestations. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a progressive lung disease with very few treatment options. GERD has been shown to be prevalent among IPF patients and is postulated to play a role in the IPF pathogenesis. The thought is that reflux may lead to microaspiration, which may then trigger inflammation and fibrosis of the lungs. Our group has looked at the association between impedance measured of reflux and IPF disease activity. We found that the impedance measured of reflux correlate with more severe IPF as measured by pulmonary function testing. We also found that increased bolus reflux as measured on impedance pH study predicts worse pulmonary outcomes in pre-transplant IPF patients. The aim of our study is to assess the relationship between the advanced impedance metrics, namely the PSPW index and MMBI, obtained on impedance pH study, and lung function decline over one year for these IPF patients. This is a retrospective cohort study, including all adults with IPF who presented for impedance pH testing off PPI for pre-lung transplant evaluation. All patients underwent pulmonary function testing performed at the time of the impedance pH study, as well as one year follow-up. Patients who are on acid suppression therapy during their tests or uh, who have had antiviral surgery in the, class, in the past were excluded from the study. The outcome variables uh, were PFT values uh, change over one year, including FEV1, FVC, percent predicted FEV1, or percent predicted FVC. Statistical analyses were performed using Pearson correlation for univariate analyses or student t-tests, as well as general linear regression for multivariate analyses. During part of our analysis, uh, we uh, dichotomize the advanced metrics uh, using existing cutoff, uh, with the MMBI cutoff being 2292 ohms, with lower being abnormal, as well as a PSPW index of less than 50% being abnormal. For our results, we enrolled 124 patients. Uh, the majority of them, of them were men with a mean age of 61 years old. Uh, they all have at least moderate to severe lung disease, and the majority of them were former smokers. Looking at uh, change in FEV1 over one year, we found that a lower distal MMBI, lower proximal MMBI, and lower PSPW index were associated with a more significant decline in FEV1 over one year. Similarly, we found that lower distal or proximal MMBI and lower PSPW index were associated with a steeper decline in FDC over one year. 
we, we saw the similar cor correlation between MMPI and PSP W index and percent predicted FEV1 as well as percent predicted FVC. When the metrics were dichotomized, we found that an abnormal uh, distal MMBI, abnormal proximal MMBI, or abnormal PSPW index were associated with more significant negative change in FEV or FVC over one year. Using percent predicted FEV or percent predicted FVC change in one year as the outcome, we found that an abnormal uh, distal MMBI, proximal MMBI, and PSP Gabriel index were associated with uh, more significant uh, decline in percent predicted FEV1 and percent predicted uh, FVC over one year. A multivariate analysis using percent predicted FEV1 decline as the outcome, we found that lower distal MMBI, low proximal MMBI, and low PSPW index were independently associated with a more significant uh, decrease in percent predicted FEV1 over one year, even after controlling for potential confounders, including age, gender, smoking history, and baseline PFT function. Similarly, uh, we found that percent predicted FEC decline in one year were associated with low distal MMBI, low proximal MMBI, and low PSPW, even after uh, controlling for potential confounders. There are several limitations to our study, including the retrospective design. Although all our participants underwent uh, standardized uh, protocol, including impedance pH testing, as well as PFT performed at the time of impedance pH testing and at one year follow up. The cohort size is although also modest, although this is not uncommon among rare diseases such as IPF. There's currently a, also a lack of validated normative values for MMBI and PSPW index that correlate with extra esophageal symptoms. All current data is mainly uh, validated against esophageal symptoms of reflux. In conclusion, low distal MMBI, proximal MMBI, and PSPW index obtained on impedance pH study independently predicted more severe decline in lung function over one year in IPF patients. These advanced impedance metrics may be useful in evaluating extraesophageal reflux. The correlation between these parameters and decline in lung function supports a role for reflux and impaired chemical clearance in the pathogenesis of IPF. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, apologize for the technical uh, glitch that we had earlier, and we're going to give our, our other two speakers, uh, Dr. Basin and Dr. Kolb, uh, a chance to kind of present their slides because they didn't have that chance before. So let's go to Dr. Basin and, um, and see uh, once again his talk with slides. Hello, my name is uh, George Bison, and I'm here to present our work on outcomes of magnetic sphincter augmentation in patients with ineffective esophageal motility. As we know, magnetic sphincter augmentation devices, aka LINCS, was approved by the FDA in 2012 for gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, treatment. However, each uh, of the early LINCS trials excluded patients with abnormal motility, and it remains unknown how patients with abnormal motility respond to magnetic sphincter augmentation. One such subset of patients are those with ineffective uh, esophageal motility. We hypothesize that IEM patients who underwent MSA had similar outcomes when compared to normal motility patients who also underwent MSA. Therefore, we focused on outlining clinical outcomes of MSA patients uh, with ineffective esophageal motility, particularly focusing on dysphagia and quality of life, as well as looking at rate of intervention and explantation and trying to delineate thresholds for which links placement would be inappropriate. 
Therefore, we conducted a multi-institutional international retrospective study looking at adult patients who underwent magnetic signature augmentation between 2012 and 2017. We included patients with IEM defined as greater than 50% ineffective swallows and matched these patients to a cohort of patients with normal motility who also underwent MSA um, implantation. Patients were matched based on gender, BMI, presence of virus esophagus, and hydrohernia size. We excluded all patients with prior foregut surgery, hydrohernia is greater than five centimeters, and pediatric patients. The IEM group had a mean age of 49, mean BMI of 26, and was predominantly male. This group had a preoperative dysphagia rate of 19% based on the GED HRKRO questionnaire. These clinical characteristics were similar to the non-IEM group except for duration of symptoms and extent of crow dissection. Postoperatively, there are very few complications from MSA both in IEM and non-IEM patients. And at one year, there is significant improvement in quality of life scores comparable in both IEM and non-IEM patients. When we assessed for dysphagia using the GET HRKO dysphagia specific assessment tool, we observed that of the IEM patients without preoperative dysphagia, the majority continued to have no dysphagia postoperatively, while a small percentage developed new onset dysphagia. Of the patients with preoperative dysphagia, most had resolution, while a few had persistent dysphagia postoperatively. A similar trend was noted in normal motility patients, with the majority having persistent non-dysphagia, as well as demonstrating a high rate of dysphagia resolution. Both IEM and non-IEM had similar explantation rates over this time period. However, IEM patients were predominantly explanted for dysphagia, while non-IEM patients were explanted for GERD symptoms. Furthermore, IEM patients selectively underwent partial fundoplication after explantation compared to non-IEM patients that had a Nissen after explantation. Regression analysis to evaluate the risk of needing postoperative intervention, either dilation or explantation, revealed that IEM was not an independent predictor, although having less than 40% intact swallows was associated with a twofold risk. Other risk factors identified included older age, having preoperative dysphagia, and having been sized for smaller device. Therefore, we concluded that one, Magnetic signal augmentation in IEM patients demonstrates co comparable rates of improvement in quality of life scores to those patients with normal motility. Two, there are high rates of improvement in dysphagia in both groups, high rates of persistent non-dysphagia in both groups as well. And although we noted a slightly higher rate of persistent dysphagia in, in the IEM patients, this was not statistically significant. IEM patients also had a similar need for postoperative explantation to normal motility patients. And finally, IEM should not preclude MSA uh, in well selected patients with GED. We believe MSA may be an option in a select subset of IEM patients, such as those with no preoperative dysphagia. Thank you. the AFS for the opportunity to present our research entitled today. I'll be presenting on behalf of all co-authors a study titled The Prognostic Impact of the Presence of Barrett's Esophagus on Esophageal Adenocarcinoma Survival. Esophageal cancer is a highly lethal cancer. Its incidence has been increasing over the last few decades and it is now 3.76 per 100,000 person years. Barrett's esophagus, defined by the presence of intestinal metaplasia on histology, is really thought to be the only identifiable precursor lesion for esophageal adenocarcinoma. Barrett's affects up to 5% of the general population and results from chronic acid exposure of the distal esophagus, which leads to IM and progresses in a very well-described stepwise fashion from non-dysplastic to low-grade, high-grade intramucosal carcinoma and finally to invasive adenocarcinoma. Recent studies have suggested the possibility of an alternate non-Barrett's, non-IM pathway of EAC that is associated with more aggressive disease and worse survival. 
Now, if this were to be confirmed, this would really have significant implications for our approach to identifying people who are at risk for Barrett's, screening, surveillance, and also just our overall understanding of the epidemiology of this disease. So with this in mind, the aims of our study were to look at a cohort of esophageal cancer patients and to analyze survival according to the presence of Barrett's esophagus and intestinal metaplasia, as well as to determine predictors of survival. This was a retrospective cohort study of patients who had histologically confirmed esophageal adenocarcinoma at a single uh, center, University of Colorado Hospital, over a 10-year time period, and only see where one in two cases were included. Now, every esophageal cancer case was categorized into group one, which had the presence of Barrett's esophagus or uh, intestinal metaplasia, and group two. And this was done based on histologic specimens from either the surgical specimen or previous endoscopies, as well as a documented history of Barrett's esophagus. The primary outcome was looking at overall survival for IM-associated EAC compared to non-IM EAC. And we used Kaplan-Meier curve to determine this survival association with the log rank test. Cox proportional hazards regression was performed adjusting for sex, age of diagnosis, tumor location, histologic grade, and clinical stage. A sensitivity analysis was also performed to exclude CWR2 tumors just to ensure that there was no unintentional gastric cancers included in the cohort. So what did our results show? There were a total of 475 patients included in the analysis with a mean age at diagnosis of 65 years and an 88% white cohort. Uh, the majority of cases, 57%, were CWR1. Now looking at the distribution of intestinal metaplasia, 77% had IM, while 109 patients or 23% had no IM. So focusing on the non-IM EAC cohort, while overall they were diagnosed younger, so age 62 versus 65, the non-IM cohort had a higher proportion of advanced disease with 50% having stage four disease. And as that, a result of that, they were less likely to undergo endoscopic therapy alone or surgery alone, and more likely to undergo chemotherapy or radiation, palliative setting or adjuvant setting. And unadjusted analyses, the presence of intestinal metaplasia was associated with improved overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.44, 95% confidence interval 0.32 to 0.59. Now, after adjusting for all those factors on multivariable analysis, individuals with intestinal metaplasia associated esophageal cancer still had a survival advantage with a hazard ratio of 0.7, and a confidence interval from 0.5 to 0.98. Other factors that were associated with poor survival was increasing stage of diagnosis and worse histologic grade. And we did not find any association between age of diagnosis, gender, and location of tumor. And our sensitivity analysis, excluding CWR2 tumors, didn't significantly impact any of the findings. So the major takeaway is that almost a quarter of these cases did not have identifiable Barrett's esophagus or intestinal metaplasia, and that these patients were younger and presented with more advanced stage disease and worse histologic grade, as well as worse survival. So, you know, to put these results into context, it's always been understood and well accepted that Barrett's progresses through this very well-defined pathway. However, there are several potential explanations for the findings of this study. So in very aggressive cancers, the dysplastic and neoplastic areas have features similar to non-intestinalized columnar lined esophagus. And this raises the question of whether this can be derived without the intermediate step of intestinal metaplasia. Also, it is possible that widespread dysplasia can overgrow the IM as the cancer progresses and develops, resulting in cases where complete tumor overgrowth precludes identification of IM on the histologic evaluation. And so potentially in these scenarios, that conversion of intestinalized metaplastic cells to cancer would be rapid and complete through acquisition of sudden genomic instability. This would still therefore represent a pathway to um, esophageal cancer through Barrett's and intestinal metaplasia, consistent with our current understanding, however, with a potentially uniquely aggressive phenotype. 
So as we can see from all of these um, results, we really need uh, future studies with molecular phenotypes to really identify, is there a possible pathway to esophageal cancer without intestinal metaplasia, or does it just develop um, progressing rapidly and completely to cancer? Uh, so with that, I would like to, again, thank the AFS, as well as all of my co-authors, and I'm happy to take any questions at the live session. Thank you, everybody, for just great presentations. And sorry again to the audience for the technical difficulties. I think you guys did great, you know, regardless of that challenge. So for this set, set of um, presentations, I wanted to start and while, while waiting for questions from the audience with asking George a question um, about his study. Yes. Um, I know it's really important because a lot of people had thought that ineffective motility was a contraindication for MSA. But as reading and hearing your study, um, is the Incidence of this phase requiring dilation, I think in your abstract it was 22 to 27 percent, like comparable in both groups. Is that what we normally would expect with MSA, or is that kind of high? Um, I think uh, the incidence of dilation. Um, there's uh, uh, very uh, little evidence in the IEM group uh, in terms of the incidence of dilation. Um, and we did note a uh, dilation rate, which is around 20%, uh, as you said, 22% uh, in the IEM group. This was relatively close to what we found in the non-IEM group, um, which was about, uh, you know, somewhere between 20, around 20%. Um, uh, recent uh, studies, uh, I mean, I think there's uh, an up upcoming uh, research study by, um, I'm forgetting which group, but uh, that showed that dilation was significant in the IEM group with uh, the LINX device. Um, I think the more important question is um, in terms of resolution after dilation. So um, in this subset of patients, does dilation actually help? Um, we noted that even though you have a 20, 22% dilation rate, uh, ultimately, the people that need the device removed are much, much less. So we noted um, at least uh, as high as 50 to 60% resolution after dilation, um, which is significant. Um, and um, I mean, given the limitations of our study, we had some patients that were lost to follow up. So um, it's hard to tell the true incidence of resolution, but we did note there was a significant resolution after dilation. Um, I think um, the expectation or the common uh, evidence suggests that you have less uh, in terms of uh, need for dilation in normal motility patients. Um, but um, I, will, I think in general, um, we have good resolution in IEM patients, which I suggest that you know, the LINX device is pretty good. But to answer your question, um, the, the dilation rate in both groups is, I think, about ex what we would expect. Okay, well, thank you. It's important to know. Um, there's a question from Rina Yadlapati uh, for Dr. Called Jennifer. Do you think that screening with biomarkers and methylated DNA markers would be a method to identify non IM adenocarcinoma cohort? And if not, what are the methods to screen or survey these patients? Thanks for the question. Um, I think that this is probably where we need to move from the study is to screening and to really um, identify, you know, why are patients presenting with esophageal cancer in the absence of a history? of or any known Barrett's. So uh, certainly biomarkers, we've heard lots in the last 24 hours about all the various uh, non-endoscopic, uh, non-invasive screening technologies that are really in the pipeline to look for um, whether it's DNA methylated markers or a different, you know, next-gen sequencing to identify early changes of Barrett's and dysplasia. And potentially this can help us to see these various different targets. Now, whether these targets that we identify are all sort of leading to the same endpoint of esophageal cancer, but through the same pathway or through different pathways, I think remains to be seen. 
there is some ongoing work um, on the sort of bench side of things, thanks to our you know, basic and translational scientists looking at these different molecular markers uh, from the cancer side to see if they work backwards, uh, what are, you know, where are these cancer cells originating from? So I think it's probably a two part. We need to look at the cancers, but we also really need to take a step back and look at the larger population, even patients who don't have risk factors for Barrett's esophagus or esophageal cancer and try to identify some of these markers in maybe non-average you know, average risk people who we wouldn't have thought were at risk and uh, sort of see where those would uh, lead to. So just a quick question and quick answer. So just to follow up, if you, were, you heard Mike Smith's talk earlier about the non-endoscopic screening methods for cancer, which of those would you pick as the top kind of contender if you were to pick? Just quick answer. Uh... We'll hold it against you. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just mention, you know, I think the site of Sponge had really uh, meaningful data recently out of the UK um, in a pragmatic trial design, um, which was, uh, you know, sort of meaningful results. Um, remains to be seen in the United States what would be best. Okay, thank you very much. And a question for Walter Chan. I know uh, we're a little bit over because of the technical challenges, but I'm sorry, Walter, I'm not a motility expert person. And I think your, your study is so important for for the whole uh, pulmonary lung transplant uh, ILD you know, field. Um, which of the parameters that you describe in your study, um, I know they're advanced parameters, would be your pick for would be the most um, predictive or most important clinically? I, I think the uh, baseline impedance uh, most likely will be the more useful one, just because practically it's easier to get. Potentially, we can hopefully uh, develop it so that we can do a shorter study potentially and get the baseline impedance and that can give us a good idea about the reflux status of the patient. Um, PSPW index is a little more challenging time consuming and patients still need to do a full 24 hour study. Uh, so I think the baseline impedance um, parameter um, or metric will probably have the uh, most promise. And is that something that most manometry uh, readers would report? Not currently, but it's actually really easy to get. And uh, I think that um, uh, some of the softwares now actually have this built in. So potentially that can be automated in the future too. Okay, great. Um, not sure we are how we are for time. Um, if, there's, if there's any questions for the audience, I'm not sure I'm getting them. All right, well, if there are no other questions, uh, we want to make up for the time we lost, but I want to congratulate all of you. You did a fabulous job and stay on because the last session will be awarding two awards for the top presenters. Congrats, everybody. Uh, I, I add my congratulations as well. I'm back. At oh, there you go, Lee. No problem. So, thank you, Mimi. Mimi. Yes. And thank you all the speakers. <laughs>